If you're just joining, my name is Olivia. I am a third year med student at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. Um, people always ask me this, um, what specialty I am going into. Uh, I still haven't officially decided, but I'm currently uh, most interested in either general surgery or pediatrics. Um, so this topic, dermatology and skin cancers, I don't necessarily uh, want to do dermatology myself, but it is the summer and something that's just a good skill to have. It also is a little personal to me. Um, when uh, my mom back in 2016 was diagnosed with melanoma, luckily we caught it in stage one and it was able to be completely surgically removed um, and she's doing totally fine now. Um, but as we'll learn, skin cancer is the number one cancer in the United States. And so I think that every future clinician, um, such as all of you, should have a good working knowledge of how to identify skin cancer. Um, so I think it is now eight o'clock and we will get started. So just as a brief outline for what we're going to do today, we'll go through a case um, and then That'll include our physical exam, doing a history, formulating a differential diagnosis, how to do um, kind of our assessment and plan for the different types of skin cancers, and then a lesson on the pathology and a little bit of epidemiology for the diseases as well. Um, so hopefully all of you saw in the chat that there is a, um, yes, the Google form that you can do. Um, for the SOAP note, there will be a quiz at the end if you're looking to get a certificate of completion um, and provide us with any feedback as well that you might have. So um, you can find that in the chat. Is something. Okay, so there's the SOAP note. Everybody pull it up if, you, if you're interested in participating. If you're just listening, that's also fine. Okay, so our case today, we're starting with a 28 year old female who is present in her clinic, in our clinic, for an annual well check. So this is pretty common where people are just, they don't really have any specific concerns. They're just coming for their annual physical. And it's pretty obvious that the job of the doctor is to look for things that could maybe bring them trouble and to be able to catch them and treat them before they become problems. So for our patient, her past medical history um, is significant for a history of asthma. Um, she does have an albuterol inhaler that she uses, PRN. Does anyone know what that means in like common language? Yeah, exactly, as needed. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so just to take as needed whenever she has a flare up. She's also had two uncomplicated UTIs, meaning that um, they've just resolved with antibiotics and she hasn't had any further issues with those. And um, her other medication is a combined oral contraceptive pill for birth control. Um, her social history, uh, she works at a bank. She used to be a lifeguard in Florida, so spent a lot of time out in the sun. She drinks about three alcoholic beverages on the weekends has no history of drug use, and she is sexually active with two male partners, and they do use condoms consistently. So these are all just things that are good um, kind of baseline things to ask about your patients, not just to get to know them, but that you also have uh, some better understanding of what their risks might be depending on their social context. Her family history um, is pretty insignificant. Her father has hypertension, um, which is high blood pressure. Her mom has hypothyroidism and has two younger brothers in good health. So overall, her family is looking pretty healthy, no major genetic conditions that we would be concerned about right now. So um, we also get her vitals, um, her heart rate 72, blood pressure 121 over 81. Um, I won't read all of these off to you guys, um, but I was just going to see if there's anything that sticks out to you as something that we um, would want to make note of or consider for just general health maintenance type stuff. Yeah, her, her respirations, I think they're, they're pretty normal, actually. Um, her heart rate, yeah, her heart rate's also, so the general resting heart rate of a healthy adult ranges from 60 to 100 beats per minute. So she's kind of in the middle of that. Her blood pressure is, um, you know, we say typically under 120 over 80 is normal. 
Um, so she's just like very slightly above it. And with her father's history of uh, high blood pressure, maybe just something to like let her know about for the future. Um, yeah, the rest of it, someone's mentioning BMI. Um, totally agree. Yes. So this is technically a BMI of over 30 is um, technically considered in the category of obese, which I, um, similar to Stephanie, I have very strong reservations of using BMI as an indicator of health, but um, it is still typically, you know, used as a screening tool um, and just kind of as a general marker for um, people who might be at risk for other health conditions. So I agree with that. It's not the only thing and it shouldn't be the only thing that we use to assess people's um, risk for things. Okay, so on physical exam, um, we have a well-appearing female who's well-nourished. She has no acute distress. Um, H-E-E-N-T stands for head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat. So that's just kind of a head and neck exam. And um, all of these terms, um, you don't have to worry so much about what they um, mean. You might see these later in your career if you are maybe scribing or if you're going through chart review for a research project. Um, but these are terminology that is just kind of typically used um, in a, a normal healthy person. So normal cephalic, that's describing kind of the overall shape of the head. Is it very enlarged? Is it smaller than expected? Are there any weird bumps or asymmetries? Pupils are equally round and reactive to light. That's, that's what we are looking for. Um, pupils that are uneven or not reactive could indicate a neurologic problem. And then her nasal and pharynx mucosa are clear and moist. We want to see not too much swelling, not any crazy amounts of mucus, um, not a lot of redness or irritation. Those are some things that might be abnormal on exam, but hers is normal. Um, similarly, her cardiac and pulmonary exam is, is unremarkable, so there were no significant findings, just normal findings. Um, her abdominal exam, again, very normal, so, uh, abdomens that are soft and uh, non-tender, non-distended, so distension meaning um, kind of like, um, like sticking out and hard or bloated, um, if you feel them, and no hepatosplenomegaly. So can anyone take a crack at what that might mean? You can drop it in the chat or you can unmute. Enlarged spleen or liver, yes, exactly. Yeah, Madeline or Madeline, um, perfect, yes. So hepatosplenomegaly um, or sometimes known as organomegaly is an enlargement of the organs of the abdomen. Um, and that can, again, sometimes indicate certain uh, diseases. So she doesn't have any of those. So her skin exam is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, so there's this word felides, and um, that is the fancy medical term for freckles. Um, it took me a long time to actually figure that out. Um, so in case you ever come across that, it just means freckles. She has a lot of freckles on her face and her extremities. And then perhaps the most um, concerning finding on this exam is a three centimeter non-raised black and brown macule on the right shoulder. So on this picture, you know, these are all just kind of like stock pictures that I find, but you can kind of see that on the posterior or the back of the shoulder, there's this kind of round looking mole that has maybe a dark spot in the middle of it and um, is a little bit larger than the ones that are kind of around the rest of her skin. So, so those are the things that we're kind of looking for um, in suspicious lesions that we would want to maybe consider doing a biopsy or um, just doing a little bit of a further workup. And then lastly, for her neurologic exam, she has no focal motor or sensory deficits. Um, her gait or her walking is normal and her cranial nerves um, all are intact. So overall, very normal physical exam with the exception of these skin findings. Okay, so for our differential, um, you know, we have this three centimeter um, macule or mole that's basically just a lesion. Um, things that it could be. So benign melanocytic nevus, or just a nevus in general, that means mole, plural of it is nevi. Um, so a melanocytic one is something that's going to be pigmented, it's going to be darker, kind of like in the first photo above the lip. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's melanoma or anything like that, it just means that the cells that are in, that make up the mole are producing melanin. Um, 
Similarly, uh, on the side of it, um, the one that's kind of off to the side of the lip on that looks a little bit more skin colored or fleshy, that's just called a dermal nevus. Um, and that's pretty much the same thing. It's just a, a typical mole that's not concerning, but it doesn't produce melanin or not as much melanin as the normal skin does. Um, other things that it could be is something like a dysplastic or a precancerous nevus. So some moles do um, become more suspicious and can eventually uh, kind of evolve into a cancer. Um, so a precancerous appearance is something that we want to kind of consider as well. And then lastly, the three major skin cancers that we're going to talk about today that would kind of be like a do not miss diagnosis. Um, the first being a squamous cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma, and then finally malignant melanoma. And we're going to go in detail into all of those three things. So those are kind of some things that we can um, think of in her, in her lesion, what they might be, um, and not try to leave anything out of our differential. So at this point, um, does anybody have any questions or um, comments that you'd like to add before we move on? Um, I'm seeing in the chat um, that there's a question about if birthmarks can cause cancer. So I would say the simple answer to that is no. Um, generally, birthmarks, especially if they're flat and they're unchanging, would be um, very unlikely to progress to cancer. Um, as we'll talk about, kind of the, the cause of cancer is ultimately going to be a collection of mutations. Um, the number one cause being exposure to UV light. So the changes that you would see in a birthmark aren't necessarily correlated with mutations or with UV light. It's something that you'd kind of acquire over your lifetime. That's a good question. Okay, so for her um, lesion, we did a biopsy, okay, um, which is just taking a small sample. Um, you can take the whole mole or you can take uh, just a part of it and look under a microscope and see what you find. So these are her biopsy results. The tissue demonstrated a malignant melanocytic neoplasm. So that means um, something that is cancerous. Melanocytic meaning that it's the melanocytes is that's the type of cell that produces melanin and a neoplasm meaning like a tumor or a mass. So she has um, essentially melanoma. Um, and the actual pathologic findings on biopsy are these little nests. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but there's these nests of these brown looking sort of like pebbly things that are all um, down in the dermis. And um, that's kind of demonstrating a compact cohesive growth pattern. So um, they're all kind of co um, congregated together and growing in one solid mass rather than being nicely spread out under the, or right on the edge of the epidermis. There's also this pattern of scattered mitoses and pleomorphic nuclei with prominent nucleoli and lack of maturation. So those are um, a little bit of advanced pathology terms that I don't want you guys to worry about so much. Um, but as you probably know, cancer is a like uncontrolled cell growth. And in order for cells to divide, they have to replicate their DNA. And so one um, possible pathologic finding on biopsy is to see cells that are dividing. You can actually see the different phases of mitosis, like prophase, anaphase, metaphase, all those you know things from biology. Um, you'll be able to see those nuclei actually in those different stages. And that can um, sometimes indicate that the cells are uh, dividing too rapidly. Okay, so we're gonna get into a little bit more of the general stuff. Um, first, just doing some brief facts, some epidemiology of skin cancer. As I mentioned earlier, skin cancer is the number one most common cancer in the United States. So um, one in five people will develop this by their age of 70. Um, there is a slight female predominance before age of 50, and then after that, they kind of become equal. The biggest risk factor is exposure to UV light. That's kind of the thing that induces the mutations that eventually lead to the uncontrolled cell growth and cancer. And um, five sunburns in your life doubles your risk of melanoma specifically, not just the other cancers, but melanoma, which is the most severe cancer. So it's summertime, wear sunscreen. 
And in the winter also wear sunscreen if you're outside. <laughs> Um, just to kind of take you guys through the normal anatomy of the skin, there's kind of these different layers going on. You might have seen a cross section before. This is a pretty simplified one. Um, so we have the two main layers, the epidermis and the dermis. There's also the hypodermis that's not pictured here. It kind of runs underneath the dermis and that's kind of where like all of the blood vessels and the other structures run through. And then within the epidermis, we have the keratinized layer. This is all just protein that's being shedded off of the top layer of cells to kind of produce that waterproof coating um, so that you don't have, um, it just is more protective. It forms a nice barrier against things that could potentially enter your uh, tissue and cause infection. Um, this next top layer of cells, so this is the actual cellular border here. The top cells, um, these are squamous cells, and so you'll kind of notice that the border of the epidermis and the dermis, the cells are a little bit more like cube shaped, they're a little bit thicker, round, more plump, more what you would tip, uh, consider like normal cells. Those are the basal cells, and that's also where you get that thin layer of the melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells. And then, um, yeah, they kind of just transition going upward. They become flatter and flatter until eventually this very top layer of skin is just like dead cells and they shed this keratin, okay? So um, this is kind of the pathology of just all cancers really, um, not specifically UV light to all cancers, but the general concept is that you get... Um, you know, this damage to DNA and that causes a mutation. So the specific mutation that uh, UV damage causes is called a thymine dimer or a cyclobutane pyrimidine dimer. So they can also happen to um, like any other purine. So T pairs with A and G pairs with C. So um, A can also get mutations as well. Um, the DNA polymerase or the enzyme that uh, you know allows for um, DNA replication to occur uh, also has proofreading activity, so it can detect where there's mutations along the DNA and perform nucleoside excision repair. So that's just like a DNA repair mechanism. Um, and these enzymes are able to correct most of the mutations. They do actually a very, very good job um, because think of how much UV light you're hit with every day when you go outside. Um, the recommendation is uh, for like vitamin D um, because you can, you know, get uh, get vitamin D from the sun. It's really just uh, activating the vitamin D that's already in your skin. But the recommendation for that is actually only about six to seven minutes on just your arms. Um, each day is enough to be sufficient for vitamin D. So a lot of people are outside for much longer than that, um, especially in the summer months. They're not wearing as many clothes. They're um, out in the sun directly, the UV um, index is stronger, and so you're really blasted with a lot of um, this electromagnetic kind of like high frequency light that's going to um, induce these mutations. Luckily, we have good uh, mechanisms, but they don't always work. And so the main genes that are affected by this um, are tumor suppressor proteins, so like P53, some of you who have been in genetics probably recognize this. Um, and the job of tumor suppressor proteins is to inhibit or not allow the proto-oncogenes, which are the cancer-causing genes that um, essentially allows the cell to divide uncontrollably. Some examples of those are the, the BRAF or the BRAF, and then the RAS, if you've uh, maybe recognized those from genetics, but again, specifics, not super important here. The main concept is that they all lead to uncontrolled cell growth, and you get this sort of um, stages of the cancer. So it starts with like a hyperplasia that's just like a specific part of the tissue that gets thicker. Um, this can eventually turn to a dysplasia where the cells start to take on like an atypical morphology. They like don't have the same architecture as normal cells. And then um, in situ cancer and invas invasive cancer. So those just kind of progressively grow and become more and more invasive. So the first type of skin cancer that we're going to talk about today is called squamous cell carcinoma. Um, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma both have really excellent rates of um, being able to be cured. 
they very, very rarely metastasize to distant sites and can be basically cured by just ex excising them from the skin. So this first photo here, this kind of scaly red patch on the skin that kind of just looks like a piece of dead skin. This is actually called an actinic keratosis. This is a precancerous lesion to the squamous cell carcinoma. And they have this sort of red scaly surface. Um, and the idea is that because this isn't a full cancer, it's contained to the epidermis. So um, like here, this is this is maybe like what the actinic keratosis is at. And then the squamous cell is this invasive type of cancer. So then um, this would be an example of a lesion of a squamous cell carcinoma. You can see it's larger. It's definitely more red. It has this sort of central ulcerated appearance. Um, and on cross-section, so this is kind of a similar cross-section to the normal skin slide that I showed a little earlier. Um, you know, we see these atypical type cells, this pleomorphic type cell um, that go all the way from the epidermis, which is where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be at that very top layer of skin, but then they're also penetrating down into the dermis where they're not supposed to be. And then kind of a hallmark finding of squamous cell carcinoma are, it's kind of hard to see here. I maybe didn't pick the best picture, but there's these kind of swirly looking cinnamon roll type things that are called keratin pearls. And if you remember, the squamous cells are what produce and shed the keratin layer. That's kind of that like flaky looking, um, stretchy stuff that's on the top of the skin that like forms the barrier. And so when the cells are proliferating in the dermis, they are still producing that protein and shedding it. And they kind of form these little balls or pearls of keratin. So that's a very unique, specific finding to squamous cell carcinoma. Um, now we're going to talk about basal cell carcinoma. If you remember, again, this like normal layer of skin, the basal cells are the very bottom layer. They are um, the most round and plump appearing cells that kind of give rise to these squamous cells as you go more towards the surface. And um, in this case, if you look at the kind of picture of what it looks like. It's a little bit more pearly looking because you don't have that sort of surface level proliferation. You don't get that extra keratin that causes that flaky appearance. So it's a lot smoother. And they also tend to have this little central um, like umbilication. Um, I'm not really sure of the mechanism for that, but that's just kind of another classic finding um, of a basal cell carcinoma. So here in this uh, slide, you can see these little nests of the basal cells. Basal cells also tend to be a lot more kind of like that darker purple or blue appearance because that's the um, that's what the stain of the nucleus is versus the squamous cells have a smaller nucleus. So they take up more of the pink or the like lighter color. And then these are all just kind of like fancy um, pathology terms that you don't have to worry about as much like palisading and stroma. That's uh, not really what we're focusing on today. Okay, so actually I'm gonna go back really quick. We've talked about um, the difference between squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on? We're gonna talk about treatment and everything. So if that's maybe something you're curious about, stay tuned, but any questions about the pathology just let me know. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about treatment options for this. So um, primary prevention, like I said, UV protection. So sunscreen, 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 and also just like staying out of the sun if possible during the middle hours of the day. Um, if you are outside in the sun, to wear protective clothing, to try to stay in the shade, um, wearing sunglasses because you can also get UV that enters your eyes. You can actually get melanoma in your eye, which is really crazy. Um, so just try to cover and protect from those UV rays as much as you can. So we talked about that actinic keratosis. This is the precancer. We want to try to prevent it from progressing to the squamous cell carcinoma. So we can get rid of this in a couple different ways. One option is cryotherapy or like a liquid nitrogen. They, um, the dermatologist or whoever the, the healthcare provider is might take on like a little Q-tip or something and just dab the liquid nitrogen onto the lesion and that'll basically destroy the cells and they will just die and um, fall off. You can also do a topical chemotherapy for this called 5-fluorouracil. 
And um, if you have a lot of actinic keratosis in the same area, so it's really common in older people who are in like maybe their 80s or so, um, if you look at their arm, maybe they'll have like a ton of different actinic keratosis just like speckled throughout their entire, um, like an entire area of their body. And it's more efficient to just put some of this topical, it's like a cream on it rather than trying to individually freeze all of them off. So that's one option, um, but only for the actinic keratosis because this uh, topical chemo is not sufficient for an actual carcinoma. Um, so for a squamous cell carcinoma, as well as a basal cell, pretty much they have the same treatment. It's just going to be a surgical excision. So we're going to take the entire thickness and the entire margin of the lesion from the skin. And then, of course, following up for observation, trying to keep doing frequent skin checks and looking for any similar suspicious um, lesions that might pop up in the future so that we can catch those early as well. Um, and then for melanoma, I haven't talked about the pathology of melanoma yet, like a, a slide of it, but um, I guess we did a little bit earlier with the with the case slide. But the, the treatment for melanoma is going to be different than the squamous and the basal cell carcinoma, because like I said, these have a very low risk of metastasis, whereas melanoma very, very easily can metastasize and it can go anywhere in your body. I've even had patients who have like metastases to their heart, which is really crazy. So for melanoma, we take a much more aggressive approach to treatment. And so this is going to be a surgical excision, not just like an in-office excision, but like a lot of times you'll actually go to the operating room and have either a general surgeon or a surgical oncologist to do a very large chunk of skin with good margins and good depth of thickness to um, get all of the abnormal cells. So um, for people who are on at the very beginning of this, I had mentioned how my mom had melanoma a few years ago. Um, and during her surgery, her, I mean, she had a pretty like normal sized mole. And I would say they took about a tennis ball sized um, amount out of her thigh from uh, just that one tiny little lesion. So they really are not messing around with this. In addition to this, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, a couple more slides, but we'll also do a lymph node biopsy because sometimes, um, depending on the thickness of the lesion, there's a chance that it will have already metastasized somewhere. So we wanna check and see if it's in the lymph nodes. Um, and that can give us a better idea of how much, if it has or how much it's spread at the time of surgery. Um, and that's just for a melanoma that you don't think has spread to anywhere else yet. If you have confirmation that there's already been metastasis or it's spread to other organs, then um, honestly, like cutting out the melanoma isn't going to do much because those cells are already in other places of the body. Uh, commonly, they would go to the lungs, the brain, um, to bones, to other skin part, like you can get little satellite lesions around the same area of skin. So um, yeah, it can it can spread to some very serious organs. So for this, we would do a full like systemic chemotherapy, um, possibly radiation therapy, and possibly like a debulking surgery. But um, you know, obviously, metastatic melanoma has a worse prognosis. And at this point, it's not feasible to surgically remove all of the tumors. So we try to target it with chemo and see what we can do from there. Does anybody have questions about the treatment options right now? Does that all make sense how we're kind of moving from a less aggressive, less invasive approach to when we get to the more serious diagnosis, we're, we're getting very aggressive with treatment? Okay, great. So we're gonna talk about the uh, cancer staging system. And this is something that you can apply to any type of solid tumor, basically. So our patient, if you remember, um, was uh, who had a, a malignant melanoma. She was staged at T2A N0 M0 melanoma. So let's break that down. So the T and the N and the M, the T and M system is, like I said, something that you can apply to any solid tumor. And they all stand for the same thing in every case. The first one is tumor size. So in this case with melanoma, we don't look at the surface area that um, 
that it's covering on the skin, we look at what's called the Breslow depth or the thickness of the lesion from the surface of the skin down to wherever it ends. So if it's extending all the way into the like hypodermis where the blood vessels are, that would be a much more concerning and a higher staging for the T of the TNM. Um, next is for the lymph nodes. So uh, the lymph nodes that are um, positive for a metastasis of the original lesion. So um, really like in stage one and two melanoma, you don't have any positive lymph nodes. And um, I'll talk about the difference between the sentinel and the distant nodes. So the sentinel node is also just like the first lymph node that would drain a certain part of the body. So for example, in breast cancer, it's very common to have breast cancer in the like upper outer quadrant of the breast where it's closer to the armpit. And so your axillary nodes, which are in the armpit, would be the first ones to be affected by a breast cancer. So that's why um, like you might have lumps kind of in the armpit. Or um, another good example is for, um, for lymphoma, you would maybe have like your cervical or your neck lymph nodes be enlarged from that. So it really depends on where the original tumor is. Um, so say you had a, a melanoma on your thigh, then maybe your inguinal nodes or the ones that are in your groin would be the first to, um, to get the tumor. So if you have one or more sentinel node or then that region of drainage from the original tumor, then that would be like a stage three. And then one distant node. So say that you have a melanoma on your shoulder, but then you have a bunch of inguinal or groin lymph nodes that are enlarged because they have metastasis of the melanoma, then that would qualify as a distant lymph node. And then lastly, the M stands for metastasis to other tissues. So like I mentioned, the lungs and the brain, also the liver are very common sites for metastasis of metastatic melanoma. So any site of metastasis, as you'll see for stage one, two, and three, they don't have any mets. If you have any distant site of metastasis to an organ, then uh, that's automatically stage four, okay? So, um, and then another thing here that the letters may indicate specific um, like character of these things. So with the tumor size and the thickness, for example, like this one had um, no ulceration. You can get ulceration or other variants depending on what um, character you're trying to describe, but uh, that's not as important for this. I just want you guys to understand what the TNM means and like how it kind of progresses from one to four. Sorry. So um, any questions with the TNM staging system? And like I said, it's very commonly used in other solid tumors, like um, they use it in breast, they use it in prostate, they use it in um, lung cancer. So yeah, like pretty much any cancer that's solid. So going back to our case, we said she was a stage two. So her thickness, her Breslow thickness is going to be a one to two millimeter thickness. And that's the depth, remember, not the surface area, because she had like a three, three centimeter uh, surface area. And for this, we have a very good survival rate. The survival rate, and I would say even these numbers, you know, I, I, I got these um, numbers from ResearchGate and, and they might be a little bit um, conservative. I would say, you know, she has at least a 70% chance of five-year survival with complete excision um, of that of that node or of that lesion. Um, obviously getting caught in earlier stages will give you a better chance of survival. Um, and the later you have um, the worst chances of survival. So ours was a 2A melanoma. So she was treated surgically with a full thickness excision and margins. And the margins again are to ensure that you don't leave any residual cells behind. Um, we did not see any spread to her sentinel nodes on biopsy, so we can assume that she didn't have any distant metastasis as well. And um, follow-up is very important, especially in skin cancer. Um, so not just to treat it and leave it, but rather to do very close monitoring and observation every three months um, until she either doesn't like want to or clinically she's um, able to go further in between appointments, but 
Um, these things can grow and change very rapidly, so it's important to check every um, part of the body. Uh, you can get melanoma um, in between your fingers, on, like on your palms of your hand or your soles of your feet, underneath um, your nails, on the eye, um, in your ear, really any, any surface um, that has skin or like that type of um, pigment, the melanin pigment can um, develop melanoma. So um, some of you might have seen this graphic or one like it before. This is the ABCDEs of melanoma, and they're kind of describing what the red flags of skin changes are. Um, so this is maybe something, if you take away something from this, you know, I do want this to be educational for all of you future doctors, but also hopefully you can take some awareness away and um, be able to apply this and, and give advice to people, your loved ones, yourself. Um, of things to look out for that would be something to check out. So the first one is asymmetry. So this is where, you know, there's uh, maybe something that doesn't look the same on both sides. And I'm not saying like, oh, it has this little tiny like wave on this side that's not on the other side, but if it's, you know, like in this photo grossly um, asymmetrical, then that would be probably something that's abnormal. B is a border. So again, like if it's um, got nice smooth round edges or if it's something a little bit more jagged, poorly defined, it kind of like fades um, into the skin color on one side and it's really sharp on the other. Those would be some things that are not typical. C stands for color. So, um, you know, there's again, normal variants with moles on the skin that can be maybe a little bit darker in some regions, but if there's um, like really, really stark changes to the color um, on different parts of the mole, or if it's a different color than the rest of the moles on the body, then that would be something to consider that might be atypical. D is for diameter. So generally like benchmark is the size of a pencil eraser. Um, but this can kind of depend too, just because it is large does not mean that it's going to be um, cancerous. People have big moles sometimes and they are totally fine. Um, the, big, the big thing here that I would say is evolving. So this is probably the most important thing. If you've had a kind of wonky looking mole your whole life that's been asymmetrical, or maybe it has some different colors going on, but it's been the same for 50 years and hasn't changed, then it's probably likely that that's not going to be a problem, but you can get these changes happening very fast, whether it grows quickly, if it changes shape, or if it changes color, then those would be something, um, I would say that's probably the most important thing on this list to get checked out. Um, and I really, really wanted to hit on this point today. So I think that there is a common misconception about skin cancer um, being something that only affects people with fair skin. And while definitely having fair skin is a risk factor for this because you have less melanin to protect you from the UV light that um, causes cancer, it certainly does not mean that they're the only people who have this problem. So um, I have a couple examples of what skin cancer can look like in people of different races. So this is the first photo, an example of melanoma in a black person. Again, you can see this lesion is extremely dark compared to some of the other moles that they have on their body. It's larger. It is a different diameter, I guess. Um, and it looks like they've already had a biopsy of it, but I would, I would say that they're probably going to have the rest of this removed as well. And then the second photo, this is a basal cell carcinoma in a person um, of South Asian descent. Um, you know, these things can happen on the face too. They're actually very common on the face. And so again, you kind of have this like central umbilicated region. Um, the edges are kind of bordered or irregular. Um, they have this ulceration. And so, um, yeah, that's another type of skin cancer that can happen on somebody who has darker skin. Um, there's some really great literature and efforts out there right now um, that I would encourage you guys to check out. Um, one really awesome resource and account that I love is on Instagram. It's at Brown Skin Matters, and um, they show and highlight different types of skin conditions ranging from rashes and infections to skin cancers to all sorts of stuff 
on different types of skin. Um, I know they do a lot of like Black and African American examples. They also have South Asian and Latin and um, like really just a lot of different types of diversity that I think is really important for the training of um, future healthcare providers and for patients to know what to look out for too. A lot of the times um, they present in those sort of atypical places. So uh, another like kind of sneaky and common one is um, under the nail beds can actually have um, be where the melanoma specifically can be on like a, a black or brown person. So um, yeah, again, I would recommend maybe checking this out or just doing some research. Um, luckily, I think we're kind of starting to move in the right direction, but there's still a ton of disparities um, in the care of patients as well as the um, inclusion of providers in dermatology and in medicine as a whole that I think, um, you know, the, the more we can kind of educate people, the better outcomes we're gonna have. Yeah, this is my conclusion slide. Please wear sunscreen uh, regardless of how much you tan, regardless of um, your ethnicity, regardless of if it's winter time, uh, you're still getting hit with UV light. That's still the number one risk factor for skin cancer. Um, and so yeah, please wear sunscreen. These are my sources. If you guys are interested in checking any of these out, I think Becca sent the link that you can get to. Um, and yeah, so if you um, are having, if you have the quiz pull up, you can start doing that. Um, again, I would really, really appreciate your guys' feedback. If you have any suggestions, I think I'm signed up to do a couple more of these in August and September. Um, and I'd love to talk about things that you're actually interested in. Hopefully you enjoyed this and that it will be helpful to you in the future. Um, but if you have any specific requests or ways that I could be better for you or other, other presenters can be better, um, please don't hesitate to um, let us know. So yeah, please, uh, do you guys have any questions, whether it's about skin cancer or anything in medical school or medicine at all? Can cryotherapy remove brown spots? Um, that's a good question. So I think it depends on what the brown spots you're referring to are. Cryotherapy is also used to do um, like warts and they can be for like certain moles, skin tags. If it's a flat brown spot, like a, let me see if I can find a good picture. Um, can you guys see my Google pulled up right now? Okay. Um, so this is like um, this is like a, a brown spot that would not be removed by cryotherapy. Um, it's just like too large of a surface area, and there's not really anything to fall off. So the cryotherapy is going to kill the cells that will just eventually just like fall off of the skin. And this is kind of just like in the skin. So. Um, for other types of lesions that are standing off of the skin, then it would probably be an option for that, but not for this type of brown spot, if that's what you were referring to. Does that help? How to remove that type of brown spot? Um, I don't really know. That's a good question. I don't know if there is a way, um, but there's really like nothing pathologic about that. It's it's very common. It's very normal. Um, I guess there's, there's some genetic conditions where you have kind of a lot of those on your body, but there's, there's not really any modifiable risk factors for it, and there's no medical need to remove it. It would probably just be cosmetic, um, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. Is hydroquinone effective for lightening? Um, I am not educated on skin lightening products. Um, I'm sorry if that's not helpful to you, um, but I can I can do some research if you'd like, and I can like maybe email you or talk about it the next time, if that's something you'd be interested in. Sorry, that wasn't very helpful, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not really that familiar with those types of products. What other questions do you guys have? 
Can you tell a mark is melanoma just by looking at it? Do you have to do a biopsy? Yes, that's a great question. So we can we can have a high suspicion for melanoma, but just like any type of cancer, um, we cannot prove that it's melanoma until we do a biopsy. Um, yeah, there's just like too much variation um, and, and you can get a lot of information um, in the pathology report. Not only do they do like just observation of the cellular architecture, but um, sometimes they can also, for different types of tumors, look at receptor status. Um, that's something really important in breast cancer, um, where we start to get into um, like hormonal therapy for estrogen and progesterone and um, protein or receptors called like HER2, if you've heard of that. So like a, a triple negative breast cancer, for example, is a lot harder to treat because we don't have those targets of the cancer cells that are expressing the receptors. Um, I don't think there's anything specific for melanoma that has variation. There are specific drugs that target melanocytes, um, and I didn't really get into that because the pharmacology isn't that, um, I think, important to this presentation. But um, yeah, they can, it can be valuable not just for diagnosing, but then also um, formulating a treatment plan as well. How to tell between a freckle and a mole and would the ABCD signs apply to both? Uh, yeah, so the ABCD signs can apply to any skin lesion at all. Um, I think it's definitely supposed to be for ones that are like more permanent. So like an acne or like a pimple um, doesn't really apply because that, you know, changes quickly. They kind of come and go um, in a matter of days. So this would be something for more stable. Um, and how to tell between a freckle and a mole. So a mole is going to be larger and raised and a freckle is going to be like a, probably a lot closer to your, the rest of your skin pigment and they're likely going to be flat or like virtually flat. And um, I would maybe just like encourage you to look at some pictures online because um, there is so much variety, you guys, in people's um, skin types and what's normal and what's not normal. So you can kind of get a sense by just like looking at pictures and, and it'll become more intuitive to you to, to figure out what's suspicious and what's not suspicious. Um, but yeah, the ABCDs can apply to both. And if, if when in doubt for you or for your patients or for loved ones, if you have concerns, just go and get it checked out and a trained healthcare provider can evaluate it. And if they need to biopsy it, then they can be absolutely sure. Great question. Mm -hmm. What else do you guys have? Any questions about med school or applications or other dermatology things that I can try to take a crack at, but um, might not be totally helpful with? Link. Yearly report on, on disparities in skin cancer. Yes, that's an excellent resource. Um, thank you to Madeline for contributing that in the chat. Um, again, I think this is something that is definitely not talked about enough. Luckily, um, I've started to see some more stuff. And yeah, I, I love that we're talking about that. Um, it is a great resource. So thank you for putting that in there. How do I balance time in med school? Um, you're probably hitting me at the exact wrong time to answer that because I'm currently on my general surgery rotation and the time has been sparse, let me tell you, but the rest of it has been pretty manageable actually. Um, I would say that number one is just um, establishing what your own personal goals are. Um, so for me, I don't really feel that it's within my goals to exert myself so hard and spend so much of my time um, like gunning for good grades or to get honors in my classes. So I really strive to um, be at a, a level sufficient for passing my, my classes and still have a good knowledge that will be able to benefit my, my patients in the future. Obviously, that's why we're in med school and like learning is to take care of people. 
Um, so for me, that like also just frees up a lot of time and takes off a lot of pressure. Um, you know, it's still hard work. You still have to meet the expectations that are set of you. Um, but you really are in control of, of like how hard you really want to go at it. And it's perfectly fine to just like go through because the standard is already very high. Um, and so to kind of give yourself that power to decide how you want to do it, I think is important and not just default to, oh, I have to be the best at everything um, because you can't you can't be the best at everything, including in your personal personal life. Um, I have a couple more questions. I'll come back to that um, one later if you want to talk about it more. But for the soap notes, yeah. So um, I can go back to the slide for um, our kind of like HPI. You guys can look at this part for your soap note. So this is going to kind of go in all the subjective se uh, section of the soap note. Um, and I know we kind of breezed through the vitals. The vitals in the physical exam go in the objective part. So I'll leave this up for a couple of minutes and then I'll go to the next two slides so you guys can kind of like copy that information in. Um, but again, like that's that's not really the, it's not going to go into your grade and, and more so it's just um, to kind of help you guys organize your thoughts and not not as much for like points or anything. So, but yeah, here's the history and then I can move on to the objective in a couple minutes. So uh, artificial intelligence enhancing or threatening dermatology. Can you integrate telemedicine into derm? So yeah, that's that's a great question, Kay. Um, artificial intelligence, I, I guess personally, I would say that dermatology would be one of the like, not like last ones to go, but you really need a person um, really observing and watching these things evolve over time um, and getting the actual biopsy done. That's, I think, something that isn't going to go anywhere. Because, um, yeah, you can take pictures of stuff and you can have maybe like, um, I don't know, like if you, if you took your own picture of a lesion at home, for example, and sent it to your provider, um, they might tell you, hey, I need to come, I need, I need to have you come in and see me and I can do like more of a workup, but they still have to have you go. And whether it's the first thing that you do and they, they catch it for you, or if you ask them about it and then you still have to end up going in anyways, um, I don't think it really matters because the ends is the same. The end is going to be that they, they have to eventually eval evaluate it themselves and um, yeah, just kind of like track things over time. And then for telehealth and telemedicine, I guess I kind of got into that a little bit too, but um, to kind of get like an initial perspective and to be able to voice your concerns, because uh, I think one of the great parts of telemedicine is that you can have better access to um, an opinion for what you should, what your next step should be. So if you're like, I'm not really sure if I should go in for this, I don't want to waste a trip or whatever, like waste gas driving to the doctor um, and a bunch of time sitting in the waiting room. Do I actually have to come in and get this checked out? That could maybe be a good tool for that. Um, but I, again, like I said, I don't see that replacing an actual in-person evaluation um, to make sure that we don't miss anything. Excellent question. What else do you guys have? I love doing these things and I don't have any other plans tonight. And I had a coffee late in the afternoon, so I have a lot of energy right now. Um, I can stay on as long or as little as people would like me to. Question for virtual rounds. Yes, the recording will be posted after this. And for virtual rounds question, if you went back and watched the videos, filled out the Google Forms. Um, I think, Becca, you might have to chime in. Okay, good, excellent. Yeah, there I was gonna say. So there you go, that's the answer. And I think we do these every week, I wanna say, and there's kind of different presenters each time uh, who do different topics depending on what their interests are. Um, Personally, I've kind of used this. It's a great way for me to actually review and study. 
Um, so I'll kind of review stuff that I'm maybe is relevant to me at the moment. I'm on surgical oncology right now. So I've actually seen some melanoma patients um, who are going through this type of treatment. Um, what made me pick dermatology? So yeah, I actually am not in dermatology and I don't really want to go into dermatology. I picked dermatology for this topic because like I said, no, that's okay, no worries. Um, it is confusing because it seems like, you know, I, I would pick something that I'm interested in. But um, yeah, mostly because it was kind of a good review for me on surgical oncology right now. And because it's just relevant, it's relevant for the season, it's relevant for me and like my family. And it's probably relevant to a lot of you guys as well. So, and I think the main reason why was because somebody requested a derm topic on the last one. I did a pneumonia talk last time. And so I really do like want to hear what you guys are interested in so we can talk about that. Me personally, I'm interested in either general pediatrics or surgical, or sorry, general surgery. So I'm currently on my surgery rotation. I just started it a couple weeks ago. And um, I really want to like it, you guys. I love being in the operating room so much, but the hours are just brutal. Like I was at the hospital at 5.30 today and I was in clinic even until like 6.30, which is ridiculous. Um, I'm very, very big on work-life balance or just like wellness in general. Um, and it's definitely, this is one of the last specialties I think that's kind of catching up to the whole like doctors or people too. And um, to have that good balance. So I really got a lot of that support and uh, I don't know. In pediatrics, everyone was just very understanding, very welcoming. The people were really what I loved about it. Um, but I really just love being the in the OR. Yeah, absolutely. Please unmute yourself. Anybody who has questions, you don't have to type into the screen. I feel like I'm already talking to myself. No, yeah, I was just like trying to type and then people would type faster than me. I'm like, I'm not good at this. Um, I am a junior um, and my major is biology for pre-ed. Mm -hmm. And so um, the second half of one of my questions was, how was your transition from medical school? I mean, from undergrad to medical school. And yeah. also, how was your like MCAT journey? Because I'm about to venture that part right yeah. now. Um, yeah, those are great questions. So uh, I guess I'll talk about the MCAT first because that's kind of like a, a sore spot for me. So um, I was, uh, I, I took one gap year. So I ended up doing my MCAT in March of my senior year of college. And um, I started preparing for it in January after winter break. I told myself I would study over winter break and then I just didn't. Um, and I was still taking classes full time in undergrad. Um, and so I was kind of balancing my schoolwork with my um, MCAT prep. And to be perfectly honest, I, I don't think that I did a very good job um, of content review. I got really frustrated with just like the pace that I was at. And then um, during practice, I would also frequently rage quit, especially during cars. I would get like so many wrong in a row and I would just get very upset and then just like stop, which, um, don't recommend, but it's, you know, it's, it's an emotional time. I ended up getting a 506 on the MCAT. I'm very open about it. Um, and I'm pretty much in like the one percentile for my school. Um, I do go to my state school and, uh, luckily I had other parts of my application. I think that helped help me out to kind of compensate for that. Um, I don't think 506 is a bad score. It's just, um, kind of at the lower end for MD schools. Um, I didn't apply to DO at the time because I, I only applied to my state school and my uh, um, my undergrad, which was Loyola Chicago, and just wanted to see how it would go and really planned on um, really planned on like reapplying, expecting to not get in my first cycle, and then um, I ended up getting waitlisted and then getting off the waitlist on my first try. So I'm just like extremely fortunate um, that things worked out the way that they did. And my advice for the MCAT would be, um, one, don't, don't try to force. So, okay. When you're really in the zone and you're really feeling it, really just harvest that. And 
make the most of it. And if you're on a roll, keep going and you'll be more productive and it'll stick with you. And you will have those times. But then when you're like, when you're really just not feeling it and you're not getting anything out of what you're doing, then just like take that break. And I know that a lot of people really push the whole structure of it and treat it like a class and don't deviate from your schedule. Um, But I think like as a person going through that, and it is very emotionally hard, you have to kind of cut yourself some slack. Um, But also at the same time, you know, you just have to kind of like stay focused and remember what your end goal is and know that, you know, it's not, it's not the end all be all. It's not everything. Um, And just do the best that you can know that you can always take it again. Um, And yeah. Also, if you're, if you're doing poorly on practice exams, then just don't be afraid to push it out a little bit more if you need to. Um, but yeah, I agree. MCAT does suck. It's a, it's a necessary evil. I don't think it predicts at all how you're going to do in med school. So if you're struggling and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I'm not going to be a good doctor because I don't know redox reactions. That's not true. (laughs) It's just something you have to get through right now. Um, and you will get through it. I promise. Wait, so can I ask, like, you said you took it in March, but like, Mm -hmm. how, how many months did you set aside to like study before that? Because I know people always do like a schedule. Yeah, so I started in, um, basically on New Year's Day um, in January. Oh, okay. um, I started right at the beginning of January. I did a diagnostic kind of like practice test. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I kind of jumped into content review. I used the Princeton Review Book series just because it was the cheapest one that I could find online. <laughs> um and they were, they were totally fine. I did not get through the whole series. Um, I think that, you know, it's all very detailed and you've probably heard the inch deep mile wide saying before with how much content there is. And you, you really just have to know a little bit about everything. And there's going to be stuff that's so low yield that like you never would have thought to look at. And there'll probably be like a question on it, but um, you just kind of do the best you can with what you know is going to be high yield. Like for me, This was back in 2018, so it might have changed, but like amino acids and biochemistry and enzymes and stuff, that was all like super high yield stuff for us. Um, So that would be kind of like just to know what to focus on. I did a three month study schedule. I ended up taking it. um, It was March 24th of 2018. And I remember that because that's when my, um, I went to Loyola and that's the year that they went to the final four. So the the day that they, (laughs) they played the final four or they, played the elite eight game was the day that I took the MCAT and (laughs) it was just the craziest day of my life you guys um (laughs) so that's why I remember so I had almost a full three months of of preparation um and then just for Kayla because I'm studying for my MCAT right now actually and I'm going into my senior year um but yeah I'm going into junior yeah so I did just want to say like I, like I said, I'm also doing a gap year, so if you're considering a great time to study for the MCAT is, like, during the summer, that way you don't have to worry about school and trying to balance that out, and that's something that's, like, really, really helped me, because I have, like, all the time in the world to just focus on that and not have to worry about, like, all the added stress of, you know, school or club involvement or whatever the heck you're involved with. Mm-hmm. year um so if you haven't looked into the gap year or like I don't know if you decide on that or not but it's definitely something to just look into I was not expecting to do a gap year and then I started junior year and I was like mm, actually that that's a good plan um and I feel like as a pre-med there's a lot of stigma at least that we kind of make up about like taking yeah. gap year, like oh like you know, you have your friends that go right through. And so you kind of maybe feel like if you do a gap year, like you're less than, or like you're not ready or, you know, whatever it is. Um, or maybe you'll have like a worse chance getting into medical school, but I worry about that. That really isn't. And I did a lot of like research on it before I decided to do a gap year. And honestly, it's like half the people that apply to med school and like go to med school take at least like one or two. Um, it's become like very, very common. And so honestly, it can't hurt you unless you do nothing during your gap year. Like if you take a year off and, you know, just sit at home, like probably not going to look great, but <laughs> if you actually use it to like build up your resume or get like clinical experience or whatever, like it can only help really. Um, so 
definitely look into that if you guys are thinking about the MCAT and, you know, just the rest of the whole pre-med journey. But also, yeah, MCAT sucks. Start early. It always, you're always going to want more time than you actually have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned that because I pushed my test back to like the last possible date that I can take it this high school. So yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, a hundred percent with all of that. Um, and I was going to say something. Um, if, if you're concerned about balancing your grades with like, I, I personally think like GPA is way harder to fix than pushing back an MCAT. Um, so there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of benefit to waiting until it's a good time for you. Um, and then also just knowing, um, the difference between not feeling ready because you're not prepared and then just like not feeling ready because you're scared to take it. Cause I remember like the morning of, I was like, oh my God, why didn't I push this out farther? And I really don't think that I could have gone, like, I just wanted to get it over with, but I was also just scared. Um, so just don't be afraid to uh, just go for it. And, uh, if, if you trust in your preparation, of course. Um, but yeah, so that's what I would say is, is keep your grades up hundred percent and, uh, then fit the MCAT in where, where it will work for you. Um, I think there was another question. Oh, that's not my chat. That's I was like, my last question was the, the transition, the transition. Yes, that's exactly. Okay. So yes. Um, I was going to leave this on the physical exam for people to do their soap note. Um, yeah, so my transition to med school from undergrad, I, like I said, did the gap year. I was, I did uh, full-time research during my gap year. So I was kind of out of the academic game, so to say, of like studying and taking tests and going to classes and all that sort of stuff. So um, it was definitely kind of more of like a physical <laughs> physical transition of like being on a schedule and having this, the mental stamina to study. Um, I think the most demanding part for us. And so uh, I talked a little bit about our curriculum in my last virtual rounds about how at uh, University of Iowa has like a, a three semester preclinical curriculum. So I've been in my clinicals for uh, the last six months because uh, we finish a little earlier than some schools do. So we did our anatomy and biochemistry and like intro to physiology stuff kind of all in the same semester. And it was, it was a lot and I struggled really hard through it, but I think that was just because I was kind of out of the, the routine. And also, like I said earlier, um, putting a lot of pressure on myself to, you know, quote, be near the top of my class. I'm definitely not at the top of my class right now. I'm, I'm very much like a passing student. Um, and I think that's, that's totally okay because it was able, once I accepted that or, or worked with that, I was able to get a lot of my personal life back, a lot of that better balance and wellness that I was missing, trying to force myself to perform at a level that's really not even that important. Um, unlike undergrad, your grades in medical school are really not important. Like you don't really have a GPA. Um, you do have like class rank, I think for residency, but it's one of the like lowest important things. Um, and passing is already a huge accomplishment in medical school. So as long as you're able to keep up with the demands of like what your, what your school sets as the bar for you, then, um, like you'll, you'll do okay. And in terms of studying and preparations, um, you might have to adjust your techniques for studying. Like I was very much a take notes and hard copy pencil and paper type of um, learner in class. And that just was like the opposite of sustainable for my lectures in med school. Um, so trying to kind of just focus more on active learning, doing practice questions, doing flashcards, if that's a way that you learn. I know a lot of people do Anki. I was never like smart enough to figure out how to use Anki even. So like I would use Quizlet for my anatomy flashcards shamelessly. Um, whatever works for you, um, as long as you're able to kind of sustain that. That's that's my biggest tips for the transition. 
thank you guys so much you and Kendra. I really appreciate it I've really been scaring myself about all this stuff recently as it's getting closer to like you know actually having to take the MCAT and then apply and then people talking about oh do you have any clinical hours COVID was this year no I don't have any and then like, <laughs> and then, like I, I know it's hard to get into a hospital maybe only if you know someone and then like mm -hmm. volunteer hours I was like I didn't even think about getting enough volunteer hours mm -hmm. and yeah yeah so it's I, I mean like so you're you're gonna start your junior year and I guess like if you were on a traditional schedule then you would kind of be like getting your application ready by next spring which isn't like impossible and I think that there's definitely uh, like a, a way to do that but I would I would definitely give some thought to doing a gap year and it just takes so much of the pressure off like I was pretty much in your position I studied abroad my fall of my junior year and I came back I after after having like literally no clinical hours no anything um, and I was like hmm you know like I should be applying to medical school in like four months and I don't have any idea what I'm doing so um I would just maybe consider that and it, it just buys you some time to figure out what you're going to do to kind of get past this COVID weird hump of, of getting into the clinics and the hospitals. Um, luckily, some places like at least uh, the hospital where I am is starting to open up back for like shadowing and volunteering. Um, so hopefully that's something that you can kind of like slowly start integrating again. But yeah, it's hard and um, it can be very overwhelming. So if you have like questions or want more advice, um, I, I'm on my mentor and like, I would also just be happy to chat whenever, if you, if you need anything else. Um, we have a really awesome team from people who are all over and, and have a lot of different experiences to provide insight. So, um, I'm, ha I'm happy that this was helpful for some people. Yeah, I really appreciate this. Mm -hmm. Also, this is my first time coming to one of these because someone told me about it and sent me the like link to come today. So I saw someone talking about soap notes. Are we supposed to take those every week here or? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty optional. The soap note is more just for you to kind of like organize your thoughts. And um, that's it's actually good practice for when you're in medical school. And as a doctor, you'll you'll write actual patient notes in that format. Um, so they're just going to give you an idea of what that is. Um, but then the actual like completion will be that 10 question quiz at the end. And it should hopefully be pretty straightforward, like given the things that we talked about. Um, and that's going to be like what you get for your uh, completion. It's not required, though. Like, I think there's probably people who are just here to tune in and don't want to bother with it. And that's totally fine, too. At me. I have a question. Uh, this yeah. Case. So when you were talking, you mentioned about general surgery. How is that different from, let's say, uh, orthopedic surgery or any of these kind of heavy duty surgery? So what is the yeah. difference? That's a great question. So um, general surgery is really focusing on like the abdominal organs. Um, a lot of the time that's kind of like their bread and butter. So some procedures that general surgeons would do is something like an appendectomy to get the appendix taken out. Um, they might do like gallbladder removals, small bowel resections, um, pancreas surgery, uh, those are some examples, but really the, the other thing of general surgery, depending on where you end up practicing, um, is that you have a lot of, so you might do orthopedic procedures or you might do, um, you know, cancer removal or breast procedures, uh, reconstruction, things like that, depending on if you're in like a more rural environment where there's not as much specialization, um, usually at academic centers, they have specific surgeons to do all of those things and the general surgeons will just do the abdominal organs. Um, but it, so it depends a little bit where you practice, but as a general rule, the, um, the general surgeons do those types of abdominal procedures. Um, and then of course, you know, there's ortho with the bones and um, plastics would focus on like the reconstruction. Uh, vascular is gonna do like the blood vessels cardiothoracic would be like the chest cavity, the heart and the lungs. Um, ENT surgeons would do the ear, nose and or just like head and neck surgery. 
those are some other examples. But yeah, the general surgery is abdominal for the most part. And yeah, neurosurgery as well. So there's a lot of different specializations. Um, and a lot. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention is that general surgery is typically the residency that's a prerequisite to doing a fellowship in those additional training programs. So like uh, general surgery would be the, the pathway to take if you wanted to do vascular, if you wanted to do breast, if you wanted to do plastics, if you wanted to do pediatric surgery, um, cardiothoracic surgery. Those are all fellowships that you would do after completing a general surgery residency. My contact info. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, great. And does that answer the question about surgery? Yeah, but that works. The only thing is that how many uh, how many years of residency is that? Is it still the same four years for, for general surgery? General surgery is typically five years, um, with like one the first oh, year being like an intern year, um, and then some programs, depending on where you are, um, have like an optional one to two years of research. Um, and for certain fellowships, the two most competitive fellowships after surgery are surgical oncology, so like cancer surgeons, and pediatric surgery. So um, if you're interested in doing those specific subspecialties, then um, it would be more likely that you would want to do some research years during your residency training. But um, as a rule, it's a five-year residency. That's a heavy duty right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a question about, so you mentioned obviously like your MCAT didn't go as you expected it. Like I said, I'm like in the middle of studying for my MCAT right now. And so it is kind of scary, especially as you like start doing the full lengths and maybe like aren't getting scores that you want. So I guess the first thing is, if you don't mind talking about it, I know it might be kind of touchy, but like- Oh, that's okay consistently scoring around like a 506 is what you got or like okay so I I was um kind of on the upward trend I guess if you will I think my peak score that I got to was a 509 and my goal score was a 510 so I was like oh you know maybe like I'll get up there on the real day um, and I think, uh, as kind of a general rule, you can kind of expect to be plus or minus like two points from your, your average full length test. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was kind of, you know, optimistically hoping for the plus two. Um, but I ended up doing, you know, a little bit below that. And I think it really just comes down to, um, like how you are at test taking, um, I was definitely like freaked out that day. And um, like my first, you know, that you start with the chem phys section and, and I like got five questions in a row that I was like, I, I don't even know what to do for these. So my like mental um, approach was kind of like, I wasn't really set up for success, if you will. Um, so I got a little shaken up and I think I kind of just like let the nerves get to me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, what happened for mine. It also could have just been that um, they tested on topics that I wasn't prepared for and didn't guess very well on. There's a lot of reasons why you might score below your um, projected score on your, your practice exams. Um, but I would say, yeah, generally, you can probably expect like a plus or minus two would be my guess. Um, and then you also did mention, like, I mean, obviously you got into medical school, um, mm -hmm. and you said that a lot of that was because of, like, your other aspects of your resume and, like, participating mm -hmm. in different things. So if you just want to kind of go more in depth and, like, what are the things you had that were, like, boosting up your resume and that you're involved with? Yeah. Okay. So um, the way that I've heard it described as um, for, like, kind of your, your recipe for, like, success in medical school applications is... One is going to be your stats, which I actually hate, but like, it's kind of true. Like you just have to have a good GPA and you have to have a good MCAT score. Two is going to be your clinical experience. Um, that area, I didn't, I don't think I had particularly anything that was like super wow factor. Um, I did um, a lot of clinical volunteering on the floor in a hospital, um, kind of like assisting with the nursing 
the, the like the patient care techs and the nurses with patient care duties as I sort of like started off with stocking supplies and doing cleaning and stuff. And then as I, you know, you get to know these people and they get to know kind of what your goals are, they might let you help out with additional stuff. Um, so, but I don't think that's really like that uncommon for people to have the volunteering that I had. And then um, kind of like a unique aspect to you that kind of sets you apart from other people. So um, like a couple unique things that I had was I minored in theology and I did a lot of stuff with humanities um, when I was in undergrad. So like I said, I studied abroad. I went to Rome for a semester um, and I did some stuff with like humanities and philosophy there. Um, I did some service like uh, with the Catholic church when I was there. Um, and I, I had that minor with the additional coursework that kind of not only was something to set me apart, but also like I can tie it into why I'm in medicine. So um, I think if, if you have um, like just kind of a wow factor, whether it's, you know, like you're an athlete and you do a sport or you're really into art or you're, you speak a foreign language or you're, um, I don't know, like those are some examples I think. And to just really like play up what makes you unique and what your passions are. Um, Cause ultimately like everyone in med school is gonna have those first two things. They're gonna have the, the stats and the clinical experience. Um, and you know, maybe some other stuff like research and leadership and that kind of stuff. Like that's all um, kind of a little bit expected and not, not like you have to have it, but um, like a lot of people will. And so the way that you can really just like make yourself unique and um, my way was just kind of highlighting those uh, experience that I had um, while I was in college. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. What else do you guys have? Um, hopefully the people who are wanting to do the soap note, um, I did, I realized that I forgot to change the slide to our physical exam findings, um, if anybody's still needing that. And I, I kind of just like glossed over the vitals, but I think they're, they're like less important. So my last question is this. Mm -hmm. So when you write all that good stories of what you've done, whatever in your essay, you have like thousands of applicant read do you think they read all that stuff i think they do so um i think that it depends on the school so for me i am an in-state resident here and um if you look at the statistics for our school so i think it's it's no secret that state schools for the state that you're a resident of are typically um and not that not the hard and fast rule, but typically easier to get into because they have um, special preference for their in-state residents. Um, and so at the University of Iowa, we get about uh, three to 400 in-state applicants per year um, for about 100, 100, yeah, I think it's about 100 spots. Um, and most of our in-state applicants will get interviews. Um, I think the people who don't get interviews are usually eliminated because of their test scores or their GPA. Um, and definitely in interviews is, is when you can ensure that they know about your stories. Um, and I know it can be really hard to like get that interview. Um, but uh, I, I do think like, you know, there's, there's no harm in writing things down, whether it's in your primary or your uh, secondary um, or in the interview, they'll, they'll definitely have the information they need to make a decision about you. And I don't think they're just gonna ignore people's applications. Great question. So um, I think I'll probably take questions for another five minutes or so until 9.30. Um, and then if you guys have any more, um, certainly just put them in the feedback form and um, I can just like individually respond to you um, because we'll have your email addresses as well. So um, yeah, let's, let's, let's keep going for the next couple minutes and then, um, or if you guys are ready to, to call it quits, I'm, I'm good with whatever. One last one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this case. So there are some uh, rural areas in the U.S. where there's a shortage of doctors. So if you target all those rural schools, 
would that give you some leg up? Um, I think it depends if you if you're passionate about providing care to the population of of um, these rural areas. They definitely do need people, and there are special programs even for um, those who intend to spend their whole careers practicing in these environments. So to try to just get into medical school in a, in a more rural state or um, like a, a, an area that maybe there's like a different demand or a different population, I don't think that's necessarily going to help you um, because of, you know, how many people are applying there, or like whether it's desirable or, or not. But if you truly have like an interest or a passion for serving those people in that unique role, um, and you can also have some some experience to back it up, say like maybe you were a scribe in a rural hospital or worked with a family medicine doctor or something in like a, a town um, where they had to do a lot of care uh, for a lot of different people for different reasons, then um, that would, I think, yeah, definitely give you an advantage, but it has to be an authentic interest. And um, I think they're also just looking for a more long-term commitment, not just something where you can uh, get into school and get your degree and then go off to a, a bigger city. Yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm looking at it in the area of using uh, telemedicine and telehealth, which mm -hmm. currently uh, we are actually doing with the home health that we have. Mm -hmm. So if, if you use technology with my engineering background, you can use telehealth and telemedicine for all those rural areas mm -hmm. where you can help them to, to get access to, to healthcare. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, certainly. That's, that's definitely a, a great solution that's, um, I think, happening right now, especially with COVID and people not being able to go get the, um, the healthcare that they would have otherwise been able to get. Um, with respect to how the admissions committees will view that, I'm not quite sure because um, ultimately, like in, in really the true uh, areas that are in need of doctors, um, they, they it's, it's just a different situation than, than doing telehealth. Um, you have to wear a lot of hats in rural practice environments, you know, like a family medicine doctor might do a lot of OB care. They might do a lot of geriatrics or take hospital call um, in places where uh, they need doctors versus in a more medium-sized or larger town where you might just have a lot of clinic with the same stuff and the same schedule um, and a lot more resources and technology and, and funds available to you as well. So uh, I think it really just depends. Like that's a, certainly a very unique combination that you can... Um, that you can tell them about with your engineering and access to technology, but then trying to also reach these uh, people who are maybe not have uh, access. Uh, that's definitely a, a cool thing that you're a part of. And I would talk about that for sure. And yeah, uh, you're welcome, Kay, for answering that. Um, so I think, yeah, we're, we're kind of coming up on 930. Uh, like I said, if you guys have any more questions that you can just put in the form um, and I'd be happy to get back to you. Um, other than that, it was really a pleasure talking with you all today and sharing about skin cancer. I hope that you learned something. And um, I think my next one is in August. So if you want to come hang out again, um, it'll be on the schedule. And uh, I'm sure Becca will post about it as well. So I think I'm going to sign off and uh, thank you guys for everything. And I hope that you all have a great night.